What makes the COVID-19 virus so deadly? Why is it so contagious? How far away are we from a cure? Joining us now, one of the world's foremost researchers on novel coronaviruses. Professor John Nichols is clinical professor in pathology at the University of Hong Kong. He was a key member of the research team at the University of Hong Kong, which isolated and characterized the novel SARS coronavirus, which was associated with the global outbreak of 2003. He's been published widely in Lancet, Nature Medicine, and several other leading research journals, and is significantly looking at viral binding sites in the respiratory tract. Now, this is critical in the context of COVID-19 and its potential impact on the respiratory tract of patients. Thank you, uh, Professor, very much uh, for being with us. A simple Good question evening. which a lot of people have um, is where are we in terms of medication to deal with this? For example, it's been suggested that, uh, that, that chloroquine in based drugs could be effective at this stage. Uh, a cocktail therapy of HIV related drugs in some cases might have proved to be effective. Before we get to the vaccine stage, how effective is this medication in dealing with this virus? Well, as you've indicated, we're nowhere near uh, getting a, a vaccine. So right now, most of the standard antivirals uh, which have been used for the other virus, don't actually work. So we're left with trying to deal with uh, other types of agents. So the anti-HIV has shown a bit of effect, and so there are a number of clinical trials which are going on around the world, especially in Hong Kong right now. So that's, but that's very expensive, and there's a limited number of um, these compounds available. So as you pointed out, there's, there's a lot of attention to this uh, combination therapy, and that's based on report which came out from France which said that chloroquine together with a type, specific type antibiotic did seem to have some effect. Now the it, that's uh, unfortunately has had some uh, adverse uh, news publicity that people have been buying lots and lots and lots of the um, chloroquine. There's been cases of chloroquine poisoning. However um, to look at this is that uh, my understanding is that in New York is that they're actually going to try a combina this, uh, combination therapy. This is, um, but one of the interesting things is that not only just the, these antibiotics, is that the reason how they may have an effect is not through the antibiotic effect, because we know it's a virus and not a bacteria, but they're anti-inflammatory mechanism. Because one of the things which we found looking at uh, both the H5N1 and the SARS is that it's the severe inflammation in the lungs which causes the damage. So this is a wait and see to see whether or not this combination therapy is of any benefit. Professor, um, you know, social distancing is seen to be, um, you know, a key preventive over here. But then there are those who suggest that there is only so much that social distancing uh, can actually achieve, particularly if you enter the stage of community transmission. Um, I don't know if you've been following the situation in India closely, but once it does enter the community, as it certainly did in the case of Wuhan and other parts of China, uh, is social distancing good enough? Well, I think... What has been shown is that um, China, especially Wuhan, are showing that uh, the medical treatment uh, was only what could decrease the death rate, but it was actually the social uh, mechanisms which actually brought down the number of overall infections. And so that was a combination of both quarantining as well as uh, attention to the uh, surfaces and also the now there's far more interest on this social distancing. This is because there's a bit of um, uh, interest in basically how this virus is spread. Is it through the direct contact or is it through the aerosols or the fermites? And the um, more of the evidence, some people say it's more the, the aerosols um, and also the, the fermites, which is why the social distancing is becoming uh, more common. Reason being is that, uh, as probably it happened in India and other places, there's a shortage of masks and so um, there's a limit to a number of masks which people can also um, can wear. But I think also what we found is that the great attention to keeping a clean surface, a clean hands, these two mechanisms are going to be extremely effective. But uh, as I think your earlier news report indicated, is that the bands, especially some of the, the younger people, uh, as this happened in Australia, is that they seem to be have this sort of a free will attitude. And so the, the adherence to these bans has um, not been as effective as many governments would like, which means they need to take more draconian measures. So in Australia, they're closing the beaches, closing the pubs, closing the restaurants. 
and because there's the only way in which you can actually force people to do the social distancing. So, hang on, so in Germany now, two no only two people can actually be next to one another. Um, so it, I think you have to force these uh, mechanisms to keep the number of infections down because to keep them down will decrease the number of severe infections and thus the overload on the healthcare system. So whilst it might seem very severe, I think it is necessary. Uh, Professor, the types of tests which are available, um, there are certain tests which have been devised which give a result on a quick time basis. There are other tests which actually need a significant period of time uh, to, to get a, a positive or a negative result. Is this a fundamental problem as we look at this from a global level that there is no uniform series of tests which are quickly available and therefore there is no uniformity in test results coming out? Okay, so <clears throat> this is where the Koreans were very, very effective uh, and in do doing massive testing because that way you can identify the early cases, the asymptomatic cases, keep them quarantined. But uh, one of the big problems now is that there's a limit in the number of the reagents and in the tests and in the manpower to do it. So there are some countries which are actually limiting the number of tests which can be done, saying only the symptomatic um, patients are all and also, we need to monitor those to make sure they are truly disease free. So <clears throat> whilst it, in the ideal world, if we had unlimited resources, unlimited tests, we could do that. But I think with resource limitations, I think, unfortunately, we have to be a bit selective about uh, what we can test. Right now, there is also now more technology to speed up the turnaround time. <clears throat> so now you can get tests which can give a result in half an hour rather than having to wait for four to five hours which can create problems. A final question to you, Professor Nichols. Uh, if we do talk about a vaccine, and you, you would have been following um, the various efforts around the world, realistically, in a, in a situation where we face a global emergency right now, uh, what is the time period that we can look at with which uh, we can expect something in the market, something which actually, uh, where governments around the world say that, look, we have an emergency, perhaps we can speed the process up, there's only so much that they can speed the process up, but assuming they do this, within how many months, if not years, can we have an effective vaccine out there? Well, that's an extremely uh, difficult challenge because, as you've indicated, there's so many steps which are involved in production of vaccine. There's number one, getting it uh, producing. Number two, showing that it works. For that, you also need an animal model uh, to test it on. And unfortunately, right now, there's no animal model which replicates uh, the, the, this, uh, this COVID-19 uh, disease. Um, we've been trying some small animals in which we can, we can actually see virus replication, but they're, they're not developing the severe disease that we'd like to use to test the vaccine on. So you need to find both that. There's the large animal primates, which are very expensive. There's ethical problems. And so testing it in, in, the, uh, in the animal model then you have to then try and bring it into humans. And the problem is, is that in the past, unfortunately, there's not been much success on coronavirus vaccines uh, in the animal population, in, the animal, in both the animal setting, because the, the type of vaccine which you use, uh, the method, and also the, as people found with things like the dengue vaccine, it may actually create more problems uh, than it than it solved. And then this leads to then a negative reaction, as we saw in the Philippines, where people get frightened of dengue vaccine, so they won't then have the subsequent measles vaccine. And so as a result, you get astronomical um, cases of measles, which is a totally preventable uh, vaccine uh, disease. So, so that's why I think we have to be very careful not to rush into uh, a vaccine, uh, which actually may create more problems than it solves. The bottom line is that uh, most people say minimum one and a half years, two years before there's anything really available, which means we're back to stage one, is that the only way in which we're going to solve this problem is <clears throat> through the non-pharmacological uh, methods of the social distancing and of the hygiene and to try and just stop the number of imported cases, uh, yeah. which is an economic um, problem. Uh, Professor John Nichols, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us, explaining some of the challenges that lie ahead as far as getting a vaccine made is concerned and why social distancing is perhaps the only way forward uh, at the moment as we try and fight this global pandemic. Thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.